please stand by. Good day and welcome to the Home Builder Series webinar, Protecting Your Company from Misrepresentation Claims Through Contractual Exculpatory Clauses. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Mitch Whittem and Wendy Police. Thank you. This webinar will discuss how to protect your company from misrepresentation claims through the use of exculpatory clauses. Exculpatory clauses, also sometimes referred to as disclaimers of warranties, are provisions and contracts, usually purchase and sale agreements, that limit a company's obligations and transfer certain duties and responsibilities to the opposing party. Under Florida law, exculpatory clauses are not favored and are generally strictly construed. Therefore, they must be specifically written. Only those matters that are specifically exculpated or disclaimed in the contract will be enforced by a court in Florida. This means one party, usually the seller, states in the contract that it is not responsible for certain specific issues after the transaction closes. It is through these types of very specific clauses in a contract that a seller, or even in certain cases a buyer, can protect themselves. This is true even in situations where one party has made an unintentional misrepresentation to the other party as to the status of the transaction or the condition of the property. The legal term for this is negligent misrepresentation. Both in state court and federal court, exculpatory clauses can protect a party that makes a negligent misrepresentation so long as that misrepresentation is specifically dealt with in the written contract. For example, in 2007, the Southern District of Florida, in a case called Garcia versus Santa Maria Resort, which can be found at 528 F. Sup. 2nd, 1283, Southern District of Florida, 2007, decided a case where purchasers of condominium units brought an action under federal security statutes and state law, alleging that a developer and real estate agents had misrepresented the development's character and amenities. The federal court held that reliance on fraudulent oral representations is unreasonable as a matter of law where the alleged misrepresentations contradict the express terms of the ensuing written agreement. There are various clauses that are analyzed time and time again in Florida case law. The first is a disclaimer of warranties. The disclaimer of warranties must be in the contract signed by the parties and must make it clear that, number one, the particular responsibility or duty is the obligation of the other party, or two, the seller is not going to be responsible for a particular issue related to the transaction. To further protect the seller, the contracts typically include two other clauses besides the specific exculpatory or disclaimer provisions. Those two other clauses are referred to as an as-is clause and a merger or integration clause. The as-is clause means exactly what it says. The seller is selling the property to the buyer in the condition the seller finds it at the time of the sale. The seller makes no representations or warranties as to what can be done with the property, what can be built on the property, or what condition the property is in. The final type of clause that is generally used in these purchase and sale agreements is a merger clause, which is also sometimes called an integration clause. These clauses, in essence, say that any oral statements that were made by a seller prior to the signing of the contract are merged or integrated into the executed contract. Stated differently, these clauses are used 
to prevent a buyer from saying that the seller promised X, Y, or Z prior to the signing of the agreement, and that those promises, although not placed in the executed agreement, are still part of the deal. One of the most often cited cases on the as-is clause is a case called Wasser versus Sassoni. Wasser is found at 652 Southern 2nd 411. It's a Florida 3rd District Court of Appeal case from 1995. Wasser involved the purchase of an apartment building. The contract in that case stated that the seller was selling the building as is. However, prior to the execution of the contract, the seller had told the buyer that the building was, and in quotes, a very good building, in quotes, would require normal type of maintenance, and in quotes, was an excellent deal. The court not only recognized that these were puffing statements, which of course are non-actionable under Florida law, but also noted two other very critical things. Number one, that although the doctrine of caveat emptor, which means buyer beware, had been abolished in Florida in residential transactions, that doctrine still applied in commercial transactions. And number two, the buyer of the apartment building in the Wasser case had agreed to the as-is clause and an integration clause. And these clauses are recognized as valid defenses, particularly where, as in that case, there were no allegations or evidence that the contract itself had been induced by a fraud. Also very critical in that case was that the court recognized that the buyer was a sophisticated purchaser of commercial property who had agreed to an as-is contract and had ample opportunity to conduct inspections and could have discovered the alleged defects through the use of ordinary diligence. The court went on to say, the buyer may be disgruntled, but does not have a cause of action for fraud. Essentially, what the court was saying was that the buyer had failed to do an adequate job of due diligence in light of the as-is clause that put this buyer on notice that the seller was not making any representations about the condition of the property. While both of these clauses meaning the as-is and the integration clauses, are generally recognized under Florida law as ways that a seller can protect itself from misrepresentation claims. Parties that include these provisions in their contract need to focus on a couple of critical issues. First, the provisions must be specific and they should be in bold print. Second, there are instances under Florida law where a merger clause on its own without an as-is or a specific disclaimer or exculpatory provision have not been given effect. A review of the case law demonstrates that when these types of general as-is and merger or integration clauses are combined with a more detailed and specific exculpatory or disclaimer clause, there is a high likelihood that they will be enforced by a court. This is so even where there were mistaken representations made by the seller which induced the buyer to sign the contract. And that's exactly what happened in the Dugan case that we were about to discuss. 17 years after Wasser versus Sassoni, the first district court of appeal decided a case called Dugan versus Peacock Point LLC, 
which can be found at 89 Southern 3rd, 283, a Florida First District Court of Appeal case from 2012. The Dugan case is incredibly instructive on the use of specific and detailed exculpatory clauses in order to protect yourself or your clients from a misrepresentation made by a company or one of its employees to the other side of a purchase and sale agreement. In Dugan, the seller of a waterfront residential subdivision was sued by the buyer because the representative of the seller stated prior to the signing of the contract that the property was immediately ready for residential construction. This statement turned out to be false. The property was in fact not ready for immediate residential construction. In fact, the city would not issue building permits until the development obtained a certificate of completion. The seller's representative believed, albeit mistakenly, that the lack of a certificate of completion was not an impediment to obtaining building permits for the lots in the subdivision. The buyer attempted to rely on some old Florida cases that had found that even an innocent misrepresentation can justify rescinding the contract where the other party has acted upon the mistaken statement to its detriment. The Dugan Court clarified these older decisions and cited to a Florida Supreme Court opinion for support. The Dugan Court said that the purchaser of a commercial property is entitled to rely on the truth of the seller's representations even though the falsity could have been ascertained had the buyers made an appropriate investigation. However, the Dugan Court went on to say that this doctrine only applies if A, the buyer did not know the representations were false, B, the falsity was not obvious to the buyer, and perhaps the most important consideration, the seller, as the owner of the property, had superior knowledge of the condition of the property. The key to the Dugan decision was that the trial court determined that the seller in this transaction did not possess superior knowledge. The trial court made this determination because, number one, the buyer was a sophisticated developer, so he certainly had a great deal of knowledge regarding developments, which of course is usually the case when you are doing a commercial purchase and sale transaction. And two, the representation in that case pertained not to some latent defect in the land, but to the existence of necessary permits and approvals to allow construction, which were matters of public record. In other words, the representations involved information that was equally accessible to the buyer as it was to the seller. Citing to the Wasser v. Sassoni case, the court went on to note that the contract between the parties contained an as-is clause and a disclaimer of warranties provision. That disclaimer of warranties provision specifically disclaimed any warranties or representations of any kind or character with respect to the property, including, without limitation, habitability, design, quality, merchantability, condition, environmental status, matters of survey or fitness for any particular purpose. The clause also stated that the buyer has conducted such investigations and inspections of the property it deemed necessary and or appropriate and shall rely upon same. The court concluded its analysis by saying the as-is provision placed the risk of mistake 
which was a matter central to the contract on the buyer. Even though the seller won in the Dugan case, it should be mentioned that the disclaimer provision in their contract could have been even better. It could have been even more specific. For example, that provision probably should have said, seller makes no representation or warranty of any kind as to the status or existence of any permits or any other approvals that exist on the subject property or that may be necessary to construct on the property. It shall be the sole and exclusive obligation of the buyer to determine the status, existence, and need for any permits or approvals of any kind that currently exist on the property or that are needed for the property in order to be able to construct on the property. It is exactly that level of specificity in a contractual exculpatory clause that helped the seller of property escape liability in a case called TRG Nighthawk versus Registry Development Corporation, which is found at 17 Southern 3rd, 782, a second District Court of Appeal opinion from 2009. In the Nighthawk case, one of the seller's employees misstated that all governmental approvals, including the South Florida Water Management Department permit, had been received, that the site plan had already been approved, and that 218 units could be built on the property. All of those statements were incorrect. Although the case actually went to trial and the jury found against the seller, the appellate court directed a verdict in favor of the seller and recognized that the contract between the parties contained, number one, a very specific exculpatory clause which specifically disclaimed any representations related to government approvals, and number two, removed a specific provision which had stated that 218 units could be built on the property. The contract also had merger and integration clauses that said the contract and the language in the contract constituted the sole and entire agreement of the parties. The Nighthawk Court cited to both Florida state law and federal law when it said, a party cannot recover for allegedly false misrepresentations that are adequately dealt with or expressly contradicted in a later contract. To hold otherwise is to invite contracting parties to make agreements of the kind in suit and then avoid them by simply taking the stand and swearing that they relied on some other statement. I will now turn the presentation over to Wendy Polite, who will talk a little bit about the Dugan decision and its application to the Olivia Savannah case. One of the best examples of how the proper use of exculpatory clauses can protect the seller from negligent misrepresentation claims was a case that we took to trial in Fort Myers back in 2012. The Olivia Savannah case began back in 2005 when home builder Lennar entered into a contract to sell a 620-acre piece of property to Olivia Savannah for $12.5 million. On February 28, 2005, after a two-week due diligence period, Olivia Savannah purchased the property with the intent to turn around and sell it to another home builder, Meritage Homes of Florida, for $17.5 million. In 2006, when the contract between Olivia Savannah and Meritage fell through and Meritage refused to purchase the property, Olivia Savannah sued Lennar for various causes of action, including fraud in the inducement, negligent misrepresentation, breach of contract, and rescission. Olivia Savannah claimed that prior to entering into the contract, 
Lennar has misrepresented that the property had a valid master concept plan, or MCP. One of the many permits required by the Lee County, Florida Planning and Zoning Department to build on the property. And that was the reason given by Meritage for backing out of its contract with Olivia Savannah. After many years of discovery and litigation, the case went to trial. The month-long trial hinged on several key issues. One, the sophistication of the parties involved in the transaction. Two, the contract provisions agreed to by the parties and three, the due diligence performed by the parties. There was no dispute that several of Lennar's employees had told Olivia Savannah prior to entering into the purchase and sale contract that the property had a valid master concept plan. The question then became, was that misrepresentation enough to find Lennar liable for breach of contract, fraudulent inducement, and or negligent misrepresentation? After a careful study and application of the Dugan decision, as well as Nighthawk and Wasser and other pertinent cases, the court found that the misstatement as to the validity of the master concept plan did not override the contractual exculpatory clauses and ruled in Lennar's favor on all issues at trial. Here's how the judge came to that conclusion. First, the court analyzed Olivia Savannah's claim for fraud in the inducement. As we stated previously, several Lennar employees had in fact told the Olivia Savannah principals that there was a valid master concept plan under the mistaken belief that there was one. What these employees did not know at the time was that the master concept plan was only valid for five years and had expired four months before the February 2005 closing. Clearly, these employees had made a mistake when they told Olivia Savannah that a valid MCP still existed on the property. However, under Florida law, bad faith must always be proven as a necessary element of fraud. In order for Lennar to have been liable for fraudulently inducing Olivia Savannah to enter into the contract, it would have been necessary for the court to have been presented with evidence that Lennar had acted in bad faith. For example, if the evidence had shown that Lennar had actual knowledge that the master concept plan had expired and still made the representation to Olivia Savannah that the master concept plan was valid and in place in order to get Olivia Savannah to close on the property, the court could have held Lennar liable for fraud in the inducement. However, the court found that there was no competent, credible evidence presented at trial that demonstrated that the employees of Lennar who made the representation about the master concept plan knew or should have known that the representations were false at the time they were made. The judge supported this finding on the fact that at trial, the evidence showed that several professionals and consultants who were completely unrelated to Lennar and had performed work on the property after the master concept plan had expired, but before the closing, also did not realize that the master concept plan had expired. Nevertheless, it was also clear from the evidence that the expiration of the master concept plan easily could have been discovered if Olivia Savannah had done its due diligence. A simple phone call to the county would have likely alerted Olivia Savannah to the fact that the master concept plan had expired. Such a call was never made even though the evidence demonstrated that Olivia Savannah had dealt with the planning and zoning boards of other counties. Thus, without Lennar having direct actual or implied knowledge of the falsity of its statement to Olivia Savannah that the property had a valid master concept plan, Lennar did not have the requisite intent, bad motive, or bad faith necessary to be found liable for fraud. Having found that Lennar did not commit fraud, the judge then analyzed whether Lennar should be found liable for negligent misrepresentation. Indeed, 
The court's negligent misrepresentation analysis is the key issue for purposes of this webinar. As we have stated, there was no dispute that Lennar's employees had inadvertently made a false representation to the buyer before closing. It was also undisputed that the existence or non-existence of the master concept plan was critical to this transaction. Without a valid master concept plan, nothing could be built on the property. So, how did Lennar win this case at trial? In essence, the court found that Olivia Savannah could not have justifiably relied on the false information given to it by Lennar's employees. The concept of justifiable reliance was not one that the court took into account in determining whether or not Lennar had committed fraud. The reason being that in 2010, in a case called Butler v. Usum, the Florida Supreme Court held that fraud does not require justifiable reliance because the finding of fraud is made to prohibit one who purposefully uses false information to induce another into a transaction from profiting from such wrongdoing. As the Butler v. Usum Court pointed out, however, the same reasoning does not apply when a party transmits false information but is not aware of the falsehood, giving rise to a claim for negligent misrepresentation. In order to prevail on a theory of negligent misrepresentation, Olivia Savannah was required to establish that it justifiably relied upon Lennar's misstatement regarding the existence and validity of the master concept plan. At the end of the day, Olivia Savannah's failure to do its due diligence with respect to the transaction was the main reason the court found in Lennar's favor. It's important to note, however, that the Florida Supreme Court in Butler v. Usum pointed out that justifiable reliance on a representation is not the same thing as failure to do due diligence. A party's failure to do its due diligence is merely one factor in the court's determination as to whether or not the party justifiably relied on the other party's mistaken representation. The court in Olivia Savannah looked at the totality of the circumstances and the specific facts of the case in making its final determination as to whether or not Olivia Savannah had justifiably relied on Lennar's misrepresentation regarding the master concept plan. The court found the Dugan decision particularly instructive in its analysis and ultimate determination of whether or not Olivia Savannah had justifiably relied on Lennar's misrepresentation. As we previously pointed out, the contract in Dugan provided that the seller disclaimed all warranties or representations of any kind or character expressed or implied with respect to the property, including without limitation habitability, design, quality, merchantability, condition, environmental status, matters of survey or fitness for any particular purpose, and further provided that the buyer has conducted such investigations and inspections of the property as it deemed necessary and or appropriate and should rely on the same. Similarly, Olivia Savannah's contract also had a disclaimer of warranties clause, an as-is clause, a merger or integration clause, and a feasibility clause that gave Olivia Savannah the right to exercise a due diligence investigation. The court found that the combination of these clauses prevented a sophisticated purchaser from justifiably relying on a casual and unverified statement made by Lennar. The court analyzed the specific exculpatory clauses in Olivia Savannah's contract and noted that the contract clearly and unequivocally stated, without reservation, that Olivia Savannah was not relying on any representations affecting or relating to the development of the property, zoning, or the use of the property, and that the contract also provided that the property was being sold as is, where is, with all faults. Relying on the Dugan decision and the 2009 case out of the 2nd District Court of Appeals, TRG Nighthawk, 
the court determined that the as-is language, coupled with the disclaimer clause in the contract, shifted the risk of what could be built on the property from the seller to the buyer. Although Lennar may have mistakenly made erroneous representations, the contract specifically disclaims any warranty or representation, expressed or implied, as to the physical condition or operation of the property, zoning, the suitability of fitness of the property or any improvements thereon, if any, for the specific or general use or purpose, or any other matter affecting or relating to the property, its development, or its use. In other words, the contract was crystal clear concerning whose obligation and responsibility it was to determine what could or could not be built on the property. These obligations were made crystal clear by the disclaimer of warranty and exculpatory provisions, the merger or integration clauses, and the feasibility provisions. The final issue that factored into the court's justifiable reliance analysis was the sophistication of the parties. This is a fact that exists in virtually all commercial transactions between developers, owners of property, and entrepreneurs. Based on the evidence and testimony presented at trial, the court found that Olivia Savannah was an experienced and sophisticated party in the real estate development realm. For example, Olivia Savannah and its principals had done numerous complex transactions in the past and had experience working with several different counties and land planning departments. Olivia Savannah also had two full-time in-house attorneys on staff who were responsible for reviewing contracts, performing due diligence on its land deals, and advising Olivia Savannah's principals. Olivia Savannah also had a land planner on staff. The court recognized that although Olivia Savannah was not a huge conglomerate, it was not a mom-and-pop organization either. The judge found that Olivia Savannah had the experience and expertise of a sophisticated purchaser of property and therefore knew or should have known the risks of not doing an independent, substantive, and thorough investigation before closing on the property. Olivia Savannah's sophistication and lack of due diligence was also a significant reason that the court found against them with respect to their breach of contract claim against Lennar. Olivia Savannah argued at trial that under the contract, Lennar was obligated to give Olivia Savannah the right to build 500 homes, but due to the vacation of the master concept plan, Olivia Savannah was never able to build 500 homes on the property. Once again, the court found specific language in the contract that precluded Olivia Savannah from recovering under a claim for breach of contract. Under the terms of the contract, Olivia Savannah had acknowledged that the provisions of the agreement for inspection and investigation of the property were adequate to enable it to make its own determination with respect to merchantability, quantity, quality, physical condition or operation of the property, zoning, suitability or fitness of the property, or any improvements thereon, if any, for specific or general use or purpose. The court specifically held that if Olivia Savannah wanted to construct 500 homes on the property, it had a duty to determine whether the property was suitable and approved for that purpose before closing on the property. The court found that given Olivia Savannah's sophistication and the exculpatory contract provisions it had agreed to, that Olivia Savannah unreasonably relied on mistaken representations of Lennar and therefore could not sustain an action for breach of contract, particularly where the contract clearly placed the burden of due diligence upon Olivia Savannah. Finally, based on the guidance of Dugan and Nighthawk, and the language of the contract, the judge also found against Olivia Savannah with respect to its claim for rescission. As you can see from the results of Olivia Savannah's trial, it is essential for sellers of commercial property to include properly drafted exculpatory and disclaimer clauses in their purchase and sale contracts. 
But for the disclaimer of warranties, the as-is clause, the merger clause, and the feasibility provision contained in the Olivia Savannah's contract, Lenar could have potentially been liable for significant damages as a result of the unintentional mistake made by Lenar's employees regarding the existence and validity of a master concept plan that had expired. However, having boilerplate exculpatory clauses, such as only a merger integration clause in a contract, is generally not enough. It is essential that the exculpatory clauses be carefully drafted to fit the specifics of the particular deal. Florida law states that a party cannot recover for alleged misrepresentations that are adequately dealt with or expressly contradicted in a later written contract. Further, a party who signs a contract whose terms contradict the alleged misrepresentations on which he relied is barred from seeking relief as the party acted unreasonably. A detailed and thorough exculpatory or disclaimer clause in a contract essentially extinguishes an argument that the buyer justifiably relied on a misrepresentation and precludes a recovery under negligent misrepresentation. Essentially, what courts are saying is, how can someone rely on a statement made by the opposing party if the contract they sign says something directly contrary to that statement? That's why it's critical to make the disclaimer and exculpatory clauses very specific as to any claims that could be made against the seller. If a particular element of the alleged extrinsic negotiation is dealt with clarity in the contract, then courts assume that the writing represents the party's intent on that element of the transaction. The feasibility provision is also crucial. The provisions give the buyer the opportunity to perform due diligence on the property in order to determine whether it is suitable for the buyer's intended use before closing and oftentimes the ability to cancel the transactions without penalty. Again, the feasibility provision shifts the risk from the seller to the buyer by forcing the buyer to make an independent determination as to whether the property will be suitable for its intended use. After the buyer has performed its due diligence, the feasibility period is over and the buyer closes on the property, a seller is no longer responsible if, for whatever reason, the property does not meet the buyer's expectations. Similarly, an as-is, where-is clause in a contract protects the seller by also shifting the risk from the seller to the buyer and places the burden of doing due diligence on the buyer. In the Olivia Savannah case, not only did the feasibility provision and as-is clause successfully shift the risk from Lennar to Olivia Savannah by giving Olivia Savannah a two-week period to do its own due diligence, but the disclaimer provision was specifically tailored to the transaction. It stated, seller has not made and does not make any warranty or representation, express or implied, as to the merchantability, quantity, quality, physical condition or operation of the property, zoning, the suitability or fitness of the property for any improvements thereon. In sum, exculpatory clauses that are detailed and specifically tailored to the transaction can protect a seller from a myriad of causes of action after the transaction is closed. This is especially so when combined with as-is and merger integration provisions. Conversely, the buyer in a transaction needs to be aware of the exculpatory clauses and the risks and burdens they are assuming before they choose to close on the property. We look forward to receiving any questions you have by email or would be happy to discuss any of the issues by telephone. I will now turn it back to the event operator. That does conclude today's conference. Thank you for your participation.